the flow that I've always been interested in professionally is this Niagara of oil um, that feeds our global metabolism. Because indeed, um, man, unique among uh, living species on Earth, is, is the only one who has managed to um, create a metabolism outside of his own body. Today's guest is Dutch energy expert Joris Vandershot, currently living in Switzerland. Joris worked at Royal Dutch Shell for over a decade uh, as a refinery expert, uh, an executive at, at Shell. Uh, before turning his attention to the clean energy transition, he now works for a French scale-up energy pool, providing flexibility services to the electricity grid uh, with a focus on energy storage. We today talk about oil refining, this incredibly complex uh, process that is in between the oil from the ground and the gas at the pump. Uh, how flexible is it? How does it work? We used his son's Legos to demonstrate uh, the cracking and, and distillation aspects. Uh, this was a very interesting conversation. Please welcome Joris Vandershot. Joris, Grezi, or what? What? What do they say in your part of Switzerland? Uh, yeah, so I'm. I'm actually um, uh, just across the border. I'm. I'm in uh, Jurassic Park. Can you believe it? Jurassic Park. Uh, and they Park? say bonjour uh, in, in this uh, in this place here. What? What's Jurassic Park? Well, the Jurassic was named uh, after a mountain range where they found these fossils. And, uh, and that happens to be the Jura Mountains, uh, which are, if I look out of the window this way, and uh, they face the Alps, which is, if I look out of the window, that way. Okay. I didn't know that. Uh, I'm sorry I missed you last week, but it was a hectic uh, trip through Geneva. All I saw was, was the airport. So uh, uh, maybe... Yeah. Maybe next yeah. time. Um, Pleasure. So you are the first guest on this show who is an expert in oil refining and hydrocarbon refinings. Um, you had a career at Royal Dutch Shell. Now you're working um, at a, a electricity uh, renewable uh, grid balancing uh, outfit, and we can talk about that later. Uh, but let's let's take a deep dive because I want to um, really understand personally and and for my viewers the refining uh, process and how central it is to our modern world. But let's first take a step back. You mentioned uh, Jurassic. Um, what is your? How did you become interested in energy? And I know some of your writings. You talk about. Uh, humans as pyromaniacs and and the importance of of fire in our evolutionary trajectory. Why don't you give us a kind of a opening overview? Yeah, sure, uh, Nate. So um, uh, I, I'm maybe just for for the uh, for the background. I'm a, I'm an engineer. Uh, I'm, I'm just a very simple engineer, and I like to understand the world in in simple engineering terms. Um, I specialized in uh, something that you'd recognize as, as system dynamics, uh, probably, you know, stocks, flows, feedback loops, uh, which is, of course, a science that underpinned uh, limits to growth, the, the report to the Club of Rome. And the flow that I've always been interested in professionally is this Niagara of oil um, that feeds our global metabolism. Because indeed, um, man, unique among uh, living species on Earth, is, is the only one who has managed to um, create a metabolism outside of his own body, right? There, there are the calories that we eat, uh, like any other animal, but there are also a lot of calories that we burn outside of our own bodies. And this started with a simple campfire um, where we cooked food, uh, really, uh, which is partly the reason why we're in a kitchen here. Um, but uh, it kind of turned into something that has really been powering modern civilization. And, and these little campfires uh, today have, uh, have really grown in scale 
uh, to what I refer to as a, a Niagara of oil. And, and maybe it's helpful for people who know Niagara Falls to kind of picture yourself standing there. Um, uh, I was there as a kid. I lived in Woodstock for a year and uh, we drove up that to Niagara a Falls. Lot. Um, yeah, like uh, people with crazy ideas. Uh, uh, I get it. And um, we drove up there. And when you stand next to uh, Niagara Falls, I don't know if you can imagine it, but you see this enormous mass of water, you know, flowing across the edge second after second after second. And I'm talking about the uh, American Falls, uh, not, not the horseshoe ones. And you could actually feel it in your gut and you, you, you hear the thunder of this thing. Now, maybe I was little, but I think it's still like that. And when I looked for an image to convey the scale of our world energy system, I thought, you know, if you can imagine Niagara Falls flowing, not with water, but with oil, then you have a very good sense of the size of the world energy system. That is the size of our uh, global metabolism these days. Uh, 24 7. 24 7, yes. Um, if you're in Europe, uh, Rhine Falls is something uh, similar. I visited uh, this summer, actually. Now, it's not all physically oil, it's, it's oil equivalent. It means if you add up all the energy we use in the world, like they do at the International Energy Agency in Paris, and convert that to oil equivalent, then you find a, a flow rate that's very close to uh, the flow rate of, uh, of Niagara Falls. 90% of that is stuff we burn, right? Mainly coal, oil, gas, a bit of biomass. 5% is nuclear, 2.5% is uh, hydro, mainly large-scale hydro, and about 2.5% is all other renewables combined. So how much is coal, oil, and natural gas? Uh, I'd say about 80%, and there's actually a, a small 10% of, uh, of biomass, like you know, just firewood and, and other biomass. So where do, we, where do we burn this generally, globally? That's the interesting part. Actually, this uh, IEA website is, is re very helpful for that, uh, although it's down uh, temporarily. Um, <laughs> they break down this energy flow in a uh, Sankey diagram, um, it must be the name of the inventor of that type of diagram, where you know you have the the sources of primary energy on one side, and the end use on other uh, on the other side, uh, and the end use will be uh, transportation and industry, other and um, non-energy use. I think that's the way they they kind of cut it. And then you have these flows that connect. Uh, you know, oil goes into this use, and gas goes into that use, and and the width of each of these lines is proportional to um, the importance of that flow in, in the world energy system. And um, what you see is that the vast majority is indeed these hydrocarbons. And there's a very thin line, which is um, uh, renewables today. And of course, that's the part that's growing that we need to grow. But in between these two, uh, end use and source, there are like two little boxes of, of transformation. And, and those are actually quite interesting and we don't think about them very often. There's about one third of this energy goes straight to the end uh, user, generally fix, fixed uh, sites. So let's say natural gas into a home in Holland where, where we heat our homes with natural gas. That, uh, there's one third that goes through uh, power stations, all the world's power stations, typically coal, you know, few people have a direct use for coal. It's mainly used in uh, power stations to generate electricity. And then, of course, you have some losses. But there's one third that passes through um, refineries, oil refineries. And I think we don't talk about those uh, too often. They're, they're not very sexy, uh, but they are actually quite important for the world energy system because these oil refineries function in a similar way that uh, mitochondria uh, would work in uh, the, the cells of your body and, and every life form. Um, so these oil refineries are like the, the mitochondria of the, I think you call it the, the amoeba or the superorganism uh, that, that uh, is our, uh, our global society. In the sense that 
they provide the energy molecules to society. Mitochondria uh, provide the uh, ATP. It's a special molecule that is like the energy currency of life. And these refineries, uh, they provide liquid fuels. Um, so it's not a single molecule, it's a, it's a collection of molecules, but it has the same uh, kind of function. So between extracting the hydrocarbons out of the ground and them becoming the ATP for our global society in the form of diesel and gasoline, <clears throat> they need to be transformed. We, um, oil is not gasoline. Uh, no, can, can we use no. oil directly out of the ground for anything? Is, is some percentage of it used just straight as is or not? No, I, th I think maybe in, in ancient uh, history, people may have used uh, oil that just was seeping out of the ground uh, just to, to, to light some, uh, some fires or something. Uh, I've heard, but it's a tiny amount, that there may be you know, the odd power station in the world where people uh, burn, burn oil directly. But really, um, there's a lot of value add in separating out the oil into different products and then each product goes into a, a particular um, uh, end use. So I'm, I'm quite likely to ask you some naive questions in the next 30 minutes. Um, if you pulled some oil out of the ground and spilled it uh, on the floor and struck a match to it, would it light on fire the same way that gasoline would? Uh, look, I've never tried, but it, it would light. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but oil is a very... Um, how should I say, is, is a very diverse term, um, it, almost like um, coffee. You know, if you have a coffee in one place or in another place or in one country, another country, it's, yeah, it's the same name, but it's it's not like a McDonald's hamburger that is, uh, that is rigorously the same everywhere you go on the planet. Except uh, in Hong Kong, uh, the ketchup is green on, on Big oh, Macs. Really? And, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but, well, but go and, on, I digress. And the French have their own version as well. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So oil is different, and why is that important? Well, look, it, it's got to do with the way, actually, um, it, it's just the way nature is, right? Uh, so it, it, it has to do with the way that these oil fields um, have, uh, you know, have come into existence. And uh, I'm not an expert in, in geology, uh, but uh, basically, of course, oil is uh, fossil sunlight, right? And uh, under the uh, influence of, of, of pressure and temperature, in the Earth's crust, these old uh, plants or dead dinosaurs or whatever they are, transformed slowly. They're they're kind of decay into into oil, and and that's you know the reason that um, we talk about hydrocarbons. You know the thing about carbon is it, it, these things are based on carbon because life is carbon based, right? And, and our it's just economy is carbon process. based. Our economy is carbon based. Yeah, um, and and so. Um, that is the reason uh, that these different oil fields are, are just at different levels of maturity, uh, so to speak. And and I think I'm, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think actually the latest stage of this is natural gas. Uh, that that's like the furthest form of decay. Once you're there, you can't decay anymore. Uh, but all the others are like intermediate forms. And there's actually one interesting. Uh, thing in um, in Holland uh, that, that really caused a big economic boom in the 17th century for us, which we call our golden century, which is um, peat. I don't know if you've heard of peat, uh, mm -hmm. which is, you know, dead plants, but only a few thousand years decayed. So they, they're, they still look like rotten plants almost. Um, and if you do that for a hundred million years, you get uh, you get oil. So is it fair to say that um, of all the different uh, um, grades of oil uh, and hydrocarbons from oil shale, which is, you know, uncooked uh, oil to peat to uh, tar sands all the way to light, sweet, crude, their mother nature has... Um, spent various times refining that and human oil refineries around the world um transmute those substances into uniform products that are used in the world's 
machines. Is that fair to say? Yeah, uh, ish. Yeah, no, that's that's pretty much it. Yeah. So, so, so what 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 the the function is of these refineries is to say, like these these oils are very different from one side to to another, uh, but the end use is actually fairly standard, uh, mm-hmm. right? A, a, a car engine needs to accept the product, and so our job, uh, you know, as as refiners is uh, to make products that are uh, on spec for the customer and that meet you know certain specific uh, specifications and within that spec there's still quite a lot of variability uh, between whether your your base uh, oil came from the Middle East or from the North Sea or, or something but it's all kind of fit for purpose for the customer and and there are stringent specs that you sell against but the interesting bit is when you buy oil, there are no specifications. Can you imagine that? There's no specifications. So you write a check for, well, you know, what's a big VLCC? Two million barrels, let's say $100 a barrel. So you write a check for $200 million to some guy saying, well, look, here you've got a ship of oil, no guarantees. Wait a minute, those those ships, VLCC, what's that stand for? Very large? Crude carrier crude carrier they yeah. carry around 200 million dollars each of oil on one shipment oh yeah well they carry two million barrels um so well yeah. you're an economist two million barrels and so when you buy that when a, when royal dutch shell where you used to work buys yeah. that you could get it from the urals or brent or uh west texas or refined tar sands or or whatever you have agreed to purchase yep. and then it comes into the refinery and and then experts like you have to figure out how to how to make that grade of crude oil which is very different from around the world into the very specific products um yeah in, in, indeed and and many refineries kind of specialize in treating certain types of crude uh, I would I would assume that the refineries specialize in crude that's more available in their region. Yeah, for example, but uh, you know it's a it's a whole um, kind of economic trade off. Uh, 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 for example, so so I worked in in a rather large refinery in uh, Rotterdam. So so Rotterdam is 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 a good place for a refinery because it's 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 one of the biggest ports in uh, in Europe. And uh, we had an advantage of uh, scale, right? It, w- it was a big refinery. Um, I think we transited about 0.1% of global energy use went through this single refinery of you know, two square miles or something, uh, 25 gigawatts of energy products, uh, molecules. So not electrons, but but molecules. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, that's, that's uh, quite sizable. So uh, if you have size, you can um, take different types of crudes, for example, and, and you can say, well, my base diet, uh, we call it a crude diet, uh, by the way, um, my base diet is going to be Middle East, uh, you know, Arab light or Arab medium. Uh, we took in some Arab heavy as well, uh, the odd Kuwait. Uh, but I'm also going to take uh, the occasional crude uh, from um, Russia, you know, at the time. Um, uh, can't do that now, but uh, at the time, uh, Russia was uh, w- was still a, a trading partner. Um, so, so you can buy crudes or, or maybe some other crude um, that comes from Brazil and, and that is a, has a bit of an odd quality and that other refineries can't take because... It doesn't fit their their kit, and you can just blend it away. You know, at five percent or something. You you can blend anything away, uh, just as in the kitchen. It's the same thing. Okay, so when we first met, I don't know when that was, uh, um, a year or two ago. You, uh, <laughs> in a in a very uh, informative uh, way that I hadn't seen before you showed me some legos that that represented what happens in a refinery did you did you set those up today uh yeah yeah i went back to my uh my youngest uh, room and and plundered his uh his <laughs> store of uh, of legos to talk a little bit about uh oil 
yeah. So, so why don't you break it down uh, for the viewers, Joris, on on how uh, oil gets refined using your son's Legos? So, so here we have an example um, of of the different molecules that that are in oil um, physically, and and I've already sorted them uh, to to make things easy. So oil is basically carbon based. And here, every uh, Lego that you see, every little round dot is one carbon atom, you have to imagine. And um, by default, every carbon atom will connect with four other atoms. So on each side, you have to imagine for this particular one that there's a hydrogen, but I, I'm not showing the hydrogen. So I, I'm not showing hydrocarbons, I'm just showing the carbons uh, because it gets messy uh, otherwise. Now, an oil is a mixture of different chains of, um, of uh, carbon chains, of hydrocarbons, uh, that can be in any shape uh, or form. I mean, the ones I'm showing here are, are mainly linear, uh, but that is not necessarily the case. So there, there are millions of alternatives to, to the ones that I'm showing here. And, um, well, we, we could say hello to a couple of them. This very simple one, you may recognize it. Uh, Nate, it's um, uh, what we call C1, so one carbon atom, it, it's methane, natural gas. So when you heat your home with natural gas, this is the thing that you're actually burning. With with four hydrogens, so you would need Tinker Toys to demonstrate it correctly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. And Got then it. actually when it's in the ground, that natural gas uh, actually comes uh, generally with a couple of the longer ones, uh, that's what we said previously, right? It's never completely pure. Uh, so it comes with the second one, C2. This is ethane. It's called ethane. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that's not very well known. So in a refinery, uh, if we go to that, these are a nuisance. So they're generally burnt. They're, they're used for um, as refinery gas, we call it. So to heat the refinery itself. Here we've got uh, C3. We call it propane. Maybe your house is heated with propane um, if you live out in the countryside. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, C4 is butane. And um, yeah, as soon as you get beyond four, you can see that there's two options to combine four carbon atoms, right? You can do a linear chain or you can do this little Tetris form here. Um, and that can happen for all of these. So, so that's where you get the complexity. And that, that's actually why life is carbon-based, is because you can make this, all these complex molecules with, uh, with carbon atoms. And, and why does that mean life is carbon-based? Because other types of atoms wouldn't have that, that uh, flexibility and, and Lego-like uh, um yeah, indeed. If you if you take uh, you know oxygen for example, uh, you know life is not oxygen based because or, or not primarily oxygen based uh, because oxygen can only make linear chains, right? So so you can't create DNA out of oxygen. Um, so, so just <laughs> here's another naive question. Um, so a low carbon future, based on what you're saying implies a lower scale energy future and a lower scale consumption future more than likely, right? Just based on first principles. Um, well, you, you can find alternative sources of energy, um, but uh, yeah, a low carbon future means burning less of this stuff because this all becomes CO2 right? right. when you burn it. Right, okay, we'll talk about that yeah. later. Keep going all with right. your example. Yeah, sure. So here you've got a, a range of molecules, um, and and maybe uh, let let me just quickly finish this. So here in the middle, you've got things that go into mo gas, uh, so uh, gasoline. Sorry, uh, this would be something that goes into kerosene, jet fuel, uh, and then uh, a bit heavier is um, diesel fuel, typically. Right? I'm just uh, schematizing. And then here, over here on the right, you'll see I I, I took two big ones that are um, have a lot of carbon atoms. They're not actually arranged like that. And I made them black because when you distill a crude oil, this is the stuff that is actually black, these very big molecules. 
And all of these become transparent, or they are transparent. It's just when they're mixed with these guys, the oil overall is, is black. So when so, oil comes out of the ground, it's black, but when it's refined, there's a bunch of products that are clear or transparent, and then the black uh, color stuff sinks to the bottom and is asphalt or... or um, exactly, yes. Got it. And, um, and and so a, a refinery basically has, has three functions, and the first one is just sorting these molecules. Uh, the second one is cutting and pasting, and the third one is treating the molecules. Hmm. So if we start with sorting molecules, we basically call that distillation. It's done with heat. You can imagine if you have a, a pan or, or you know a distillation tower with all these molecules uh, kind of mixed up and you heat it, then the lightest ones are gonna evaporate um, first, right? And there's actually a heat profile in these columns which um, which causes these uh, fractions, as we call them, fractions of the barrel to separate into different cuts. And you, you extract them from the distillation column in different cuts. Uh, so typically, for example, these two guys, they might go together, uh, C3, C4, they can be sold together as LPG, right? And then maybe in the next column, they're separated out into propane and butane uh, because we want to sell those separately, for example. Um, now, but the most important cut is uh, on the on the heavy end, where you separate what we call the residue uh, from the um, transparent products, right? This so, stuff uh, is generally worth less than crude, and these these molecules are generally worth more than the crude oil that goes into your column. So that's the basic okay. economics of this. So what, what does the yellow represent on the diesel? The yellow ones here are um, sulfur atoms. So there is, and they're considered as a, mm, impurities that need to come out of your fuels for different reasons. And so uh, the third function uh, of the refinery, cleaning, uh, cleaning the molecules, is mainly about removing these yellow bits uh, that represents sulfur. Now they can be attached to all of these. Uh, I just had an example mm -hmm. here uh, in the diesel one, and it's roughly uh, proportional. So this this would be a you know a medium sulfur crude with about you know five atoms of sulfur for well I haven't counted it, but uh, something like two hundred atoms of carbon. And and does uh, the sulfur is the sulfur in all oil or does some oil have a lot more sulfur? Oh, it's a very big difference. It, it's a main differentiator for crudes, and, and it's a main determinant of their value because not all refiners have the equipment to remove the sulfur. And what, what is, why do we need to remove the sulfur? Mainly two reasons. Uh, historically, um, it's been about uh, acid rain. Okay. And actually, I, I think that is a pretty nice example of how regulated capitalism can work, uh, at least what I've seen in the Netherlands, um, is, you know, uh, your your company goes out and, and delivers some product, and at some point, society finds that there's a problem uh, with, with your product. And then you sit around a table and you say, look, this sulfur is causing acid rain. We've got to do something about it. Uh, we realize you can't do it tomorrow, but let's start a plan to reduce sulfur over time. And so that's what ha what has happened uh, in European refineries, and I'm sure it's the same for American refineries. No, no, I don't. I'm not expecting you to be an expert on this, but I have uh, heard that one of the explanations for the record temperatures this summer and and yesterday was announced that September was the all time hottest September uh, on in recent times was because of the lowering of sulfur content in marine fuel due to environmental regulations has reduced the masking effect um, of, of sulfur particles and therefore in the short term boosted global warming. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, oh yeah, sure. Um, so um, marine fuel is the black stuff. Right, mm -hmm. we hadn't quite finished our uh, our distillation, but this residue uh, is not thrown away. It's it's going to specific uses, which are bitumen, um, 
and marine fuel, basically. Big ships, they have engines that can handle this black stuff. And as you what, can see- what is, what is bitumen? Oh, uh, sorry, asphalt. So uh, the stuff you, you make roads with. Right. So, um, but isn't tar sands also called bitumen? And does tar sands not need to be refined as much and can be used as asphalt? Um, so, so uh, I'm not an expert on, on tar sands, uh, but by the name and, and by its reputation, it's extremely heavy uh, crude and it's mixed with sand, right? Uh, so, so you're, you're going to have to separate out particles of sand. Um, I don't know how they do that. But the other thing is, it's got a huge proportion of this black stuff, and not much of this white stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, so maybe you know, maybe only uh, this much or something. Right. Right. So, what you then have to do with tar sands, and that brings me to an intermediate. Uh, function of a refinery, we, we said the refinery needs to sort these molecules, it needs to treat uh, the sulfur, but it also reforms molecules, it cuts and pastes mo molecules. And this guy in particular, it goes with the residue, it's called vacuum gas oil, it's distilled out in a separate column, and then it can go into what we call a cracker. Um, in America you have cat crackers, there are uh, which means catalytic crackers. Hydro crackers are more in Europe, or you have thermal crackers. All of those, what they do is they just cut these large molecules into smaller ones so that this guy can now go into diesel, and maybe this guy can now go into gasoline. So how, how do they cut them mechanically? How does that actually happen? So uh, the brute force is um, temperature. Okay. You heat it up uh, enough and at some point they, they will crack, they will just break. And then there are smarter forms if you use certain catalysts, that's cat crackers. Another uh, form to do it is you do the same thing in a hydrogen environment, you know, catalyst and a hydrogen environment, and then you get a, a hydro cracker. And one will crack it more into diesel components, another uh, the, the cat cracker will make more gasoline components, for example. Now, the tar sands that you were talking about are a lot of this very heavy stuff. So they will need a lot of cracking, upgrading, they'll probably call it. To come back to the sulfur, though, um, the, marine, uh, the marine fuel you were asking about, it used to have a specification, um, and I must say, I'm I might be slightly outdated, um, but it, it, the, uh, there, are, there were two specifications on the ocean because we get the sulfur out for acid rain, but out on the open ocean, sulfur is l less of an issue, right? Because there's no forests. Yeah, but, the, but those clouds eventually make their way to land somewhere. Yeah. So, uh, look, I'm not a, I'm not <laughs> okay, a sorry, the right sorry. person to have the exact rules on that. But <laughs> unlike CO2, uh, because people mix up CO2 and and sulfur very often and and get it completely mixed up. Um, so, unlike CO2, sulfur is more of a regional problem, right? Mm. Uh, so, if you have a ship uh, out uh, sailing in Antarctica. But the sulfur it emits is not going to be a problem uh, uh, in forests. Okay. So for a long time, these fuels have uh, admitted quite a high percentage of sulfur. Um, I think it was four and a half percent or something. And then the the regional seas, like uh, the North Sea, uh, so around the continents, started implementing low sulfur bunkers or, or enforcing low sulfur bunkers. Uh, because they found that the ships that were sailing close to the shorelines did actually impact um, acid rain. And, and there's a couple of other environmental um, uh, issues with, with sulfur as well. So they started regulating this to 1.5%. Um, but now um, the, global, um, the, the global specification has been lowered. I don't know to what level, 
But I, I'm pretty sure that that is the reason why there is now less sulfur emitted. And these sulfur emissions, they cause particles up in the, in the atmosphere that partly reflect sunlight, which is why they depress temperatures. You know, there are these geoengineering uh, schemes where, where people want to inject particles into the atmosphere to reflect sunlight. So we're all less, uh, less warm. Well, sulfur does some of that um, by itself. So if you, if you remove the sulfur from your fuels, uh, I can imagine that you have a temporary impact on that. Yes. Great. Let's, uh, let's reduce the temperature and kill all the trees. Um, I'm partially kidding. Okay. So let's get back to the big picture here, Joris. Um, I'm sure you've watched my, um, my frankly series, uh, on just stop oil on on refining and i made just a not a detailed but just a general observation that if for some reason we didn't need gasoline because we had all electric cars for for example i argued that at least in the near term it would not significantly change the demand for oil uh, or the, the need to extract the same amount of oil, like 30 billion barrels a year that we're extracting because of what you just illustrated that gasoline is, but one of those white, uh, series of carbon atoms that we get from a barrel of oil. And, and if we still had the demand in the global economy for all the other things, we would roughly need the same amount of, of oil. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so look, I, I think on the on the on the short term, uh, you're right. The, these refiners they they have what um, what we call the the butcher's problem, right? A, a butcher cannot only sell uh, T-bone steaks. Um, mm. the, you know, he has to buy an entire cow, and he's got to sell every part of that cow. Um, so if, if the, if there's a reduced demand for one of the, uh, you know, one of the elements, yeah, he still has to sell these other elements, but I think what happens, um, in, in the oil industry historically is that, uh, if you give it enough time, um, uh, there, uh, well, on the very short term, like, like, you know, today or tomorrow, there is flexibility in these refineries to some extent. So, for example, um, there are molecules, uh, let's say, uh, C10, the one that's 10 long. It might go into gasoline and your car works fine with it if it's a part of it. But it can also, you can also cut it into uh, the jet fraction. So, so these are distributions, right? The, these, these cuts of the barrels are, are distributions. And so you can play a little bit with those uh, distributions. I, I read a, a Conoco um, PowerPoint a couple weeks ago that said that there's like three or 4% flexibility currently like that, but it's not 30 or 40%. No, you're right. This is on, on, on the margin. Um, and, and then with a little bit more time. Um, uh, so, uh, sorry, there's, a possibility also for different uses, um, of course. So in Europe, for example, we send molecules to um, the chemical industry that in the US might go into gasoline. So, so, so you can just route things to different uses, but of course you have to have the use for it. Um, but on the medium term, I, I think if you reduce the, the gasoline demand uh, fairly intensely, um, Refineries will start adapting and will will use their flexibility. And on the kind of ten year term, they will be able to invest in units um, that just make different products uh, that are more suited to your new situation. So over time, um, the refineries can adapt. But we would still need diesel and bitumen for roads and naphtha for plastic precursors and all those other products, unless those demand for those products goes away as well. Oh yeah, sure. But, um, you know, in the end it's a, it's a mass balance thing, right? It, it, if you have less demand, even if it's just on one of your products in the end, you're going to need less crude oil. I, I don't know the situation in Europe, but in the United States, they're not building any new refineries. Um, and 
I know that the majority of our crude is um, shale oil, light oil, and we have to pair it with our existing refineries with heavier oil from somewhere else to get the portfolio of, of atoms uh, or of molecules that you just described. Is that a, um, a risk to the global refining industry as the world uh, has more geopolitical instability and different existing built infrastructure refineries require a certain caliber of oil or how much can we MacGyver the existing refineries to adapt to, um, you know, a, 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 a narrower, um, portfolio of inputs to, to their refinery. Um, I think we have we have quite some flexibility, but uh, overall, uh, I'd expect that at least in Europe we've we've seen uh, refinery closures. So the smaller ones and the simpler refineries that have less upgrading uh, capacity will will close first because they're the ones that make the least money, and the larger ones are are able to uh, to mix as you de just described. Uh, maybe a very heavy crude and pair it with a very light one, and then you just make a 50-50 mix uh, so that you have your distillation column kind of nicely balanced and, and, and all your subsequent units. Uh, so you can do quite a lot, um, I, I think. If, if you're talking about um, more and more um, high sulfur crudes, uh, for example, it, it needs investment in desulfurization capacity. Uh, so you may see uh, an ongoing need for investment in these assets uh, so that they can treat, uh, you know, the, the increasingly difficult crude oil. Because I, I think the stuff we're getting out of the ground, especially in the States, uh, you know, becomes more and more uh, complex. And and this is why for, for tar sands, for example, the, the, the overall... Um, CO2 impact is, is also a bit higher than for regular crude because it's so much more difficult to refine and upgrade. So what about, uh, and just feel free to tell me if this is a, a question you don't um, have expertise in, but there is um, the chemistry of scaling and overbuilding solar, wind, and other renewable technologies um, combined with hydrolysis to create zero carbon or low carbon fossil fuels. Like we can create some of these, uh, chemical chains, uh, with technology at a higher cost. W what can we do and what can't we do? And, and what are the trade-offs, uh, in that? Um, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm not the best expert to ask, but on, on a kind of conceptual level, um, you know, there is carbon around um, and you can shape that and create your own molecules, but it's going to take you a lot of energy uh, and and uh, equipment uh, to do that, right? So um, I've, I've seen some schemes to pull carbon out of the air, for example. That, that doesn't sound uh, very efficient to me. Uh, I mean, it seems crazy, uh, to be honest, uh, yeah. to me, to, to build machines to get carbon, to get the CO2 out of, out of the atmosphere, given the, the, the concentration levels in the atmosphere, right? You're going to burn a lot more carbon uh, with the energy uh, that you use in order to do that. I, I have not seen one of those schemes that, that works. And unfortunately, some of the IPCC scenarios of a fully built in uh, developed global technology that pulls carbon out of the air that way yeah to me um, you know if, you, if you're talking uh, reducing carbon levels like, like that uh, the only thing to that makes sense to, uh, to me but it's more of an intuition than that I've done any sums is is to use nature right uh, nature uh, a tree, uh, pulls mm -hmm. carbon from the air, so uh, plant trees, or or maybe some of the more, uh, let's say, uh, novel things uh, might be to to stimulate algae uh, growth in the oceans or something like that. But I'm I'm sure that has its uh, downsides as well. But but you know, nature can do things for us like that. Or um, I, I think there's some people looking at uh, enhanced rock weathering. Uh, um, but uh, building machines to pull out uh, carbon doesn't doesn't sound uh, very promising to me. So, uh, what does sound promising to you? Um, 
in in your history at at an oil refinery and um what do you think about our future uh on energy depletion climate change technology what what are you thinking right well um i i kind of think in in uh in scenarios right and uh i i think there's there's one scenario uh which is by far the most likely one uh, is that that we're going to transition away uh from using this um uh solar capital uh, that we have in the ground to using uh solar income um in the form of um photovoltaics wind farms uh and, and the likes um I don't think that will be overnight uh, at all. Uh, so I'm I'm not very uh, optimistic about the speed at which we can actually transition, um, because the the investment you need to do is, uh, or the results are linear with the investment that you you have to do. Right? Um, sometimes people say, "Oh, yeah, it's all going to be exponential," uh, and and they cite the uh, the equivalence of, uh, of of the microchip revolution but i think the big difference uh with with that type of exponential uh growth in in the microchips was actually that it was uh a, an exponential shrinkage right you, they just managed to etch more and more circuits into a fixed amount of uh, material whereas if you want to grow uh solar um, PV exponentially, it means you just have to put more, cover more and more square meters or square feet or whatever you want to do, or you call it. And I think that is going to take uh, a lot of time and, and time we may not have. But even that isn't an energy transition. It's, it's an energy addition to the global superorganism, which is totally dependent on hydrocarbons it's more like uh building a protuberance on on the body of the superorganism that might end up as a fin or a wing or something but it's not replacing the whole body um do you no, think for the moment we aren't yeah you're, you're right for the moment it's only additive so 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 we're maybe avoiding you know we've avoided further growth uh but but for the moment uh, fossil fuels are still growing and 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 so that's a a real issue and, and the underlying um, issue is of course that we're you know from um uh kind of uh, energy concentration perspective we're we're going back to being hunter gatherers right uh we 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 we're chasing uh the wind and 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 the photons um, that, that you have to catch with these uh, giant nets we call uh, uh, PV panels or, or these blades we call wind turbines. Well, I think you said it aptly earlier is we're trying to shift from using solar capital, our stored sunlight bank account, to living on solar interest, which is the daily, weekly, monthly flows of the sun and the wind plus technology. Um, so usually when people start living on interest instead of drawing down capital, they have to uh, consume less. So I don't see a way that we can have a 19 or 20 terawatt society with renewables, not even close. But I do think in tandem with declining oil and gas and hopefully not much coal um, with solar, like you point out, there is some intermediate uh, landing point for society. Have you done the numbers on that or do you have any opinions on the size or how that might look like? Uh, no, I haven't done the numbers, but uh, I've, I've seen different uh, scenarios of, of uh, I, I don't think there are many scenarios that, um, that see this 20 terawatt going up. Uh, but there is a lot of room. Other than the IMF and the World Bank and the United Nations and, and most of the international uh, authorities. Yeah, well, um, well, we'll see about that. But I think there's a lot of room in, um, in efficiency, though, um, because the 20 terawatt is primary energy and you don't have to replace about, I don't know, 40% of that uh, is just waste heat. 
mm-hmm. and so you don't have to replace the waste heat of course uh, when when you install your uh, your solar panels in your uh, and your wind farms so what ends up happening is if we stabilize and somehow are able to keep the financial system intact is turning a larger percentage of our machines to motors uh, that are more efficient it it um it's kind of a reverse jevons paradox that on the flat to down slope that efficiency will soften the blow um if more of our machines are electric as opposed to wasting much mo- most of the energy uh, just to move a three thousand pound vehicle uh powered by gasoline or diesel well, yeah, it, it 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 should be a combination of a lot of things, right? Uh, so so the switch uh, to electric is is uh, for vehicles is uh, is part of the answer. Uh, so I I'm Dutch, so I I think uh, we should cycle more uh, where I'm possible. I'm Dutch too, and I cycle uh, every and day. So are you? Ah, oh, good. Um, so. Uh, you know, a lot of our our, our movements uh, are are luxury movements. Uh, let, let's face it. You know, I, I see it everywhere. We we you know we we drive our kids to school. Uh, yeah, it's just crazy when you think about it. Um, so so I think uh, there's a case for um, for more simplification and um, and also you know smarter use of uh, of heating. Heat is a is a big part of the equation. And I think uh, you know, for a house, if you, through smart design, you can uh, really bring down the amount of calories that you need uh, to keep a comfortable temperature in your house. So uh, to totally put you on the spot, Joris, if you were advising the EU on energy policy, given what you know uh, with your refinery background, and obviously you follow this podcast and are fluent in in these systemic issues, what are what are some of the things that you think uh, the EU and the world are doing now in the energy space that are likely dead ends? And what are some things that should be expanded and, and looked into? And what are some other possibilities that should be researched, even if they're not on the radar right now? Look, I don't have a strong opinion on on what uh, what, what the EU is or, or isn't doing at the moment. I, th- I think there's a lot of professionals in the field uh, that, that see the future and sometimes uh, you know there may be a bit of hype around this or that but but i think we should try a lot of things and and also see what works right you don't always know from the start uh which technology for example is is going to work i think it's um well possible that there may be a lot of advances for example in uh, energy storage technology still right where you where you might say well yeah you know the lithium and the this and the that um actually Contrary to the PV panels, where where I see this linear relationship between you know if you want more power you have to install more uh, square meters, um, I'm not sure we've we've hit the um, the the bottom yet with uh, energy storage technologies, and maybe we will find uh, novel chemistries uh, that are much less of an issue in terms of resources and that could really give us a performance boost. So so. Uh, I'm pretty sure that that there's a lot of uh, upside in that. Well, there are there are things that are more simple chemistries like sodium batteries that aren't as good as lithium batteries but are still pretty good and salt is eminently more available than lithium. Yeah, for for example, and uh, and and I think there there's, you know, multitude of examples uh, I hear in the states there's this uh, uh startup doing um storing energy with rust. Right, just iron rust, and uh, yeah, it's not as compact as other batteries. It maybe takes up ten times more volume, uh, but if it's based on iron uh, and it's for a grid scale battery, maybe that's a good solution. You know, so so I think there's a, a lot of room for innovation on on that particular front uh, still. Um, nor do I think that uh, you know batteries are the only uh, solution to energy storage. Uh, by the way, especially in my current role. Uh, because we also see a lot of room uh, in terms of managing uh, flexible energy demand uh, with uh, the end uh, customers, right? Um, I think historically, uh, industries have always kind of flocked around places where in space and in time, energy was concentrated and, and thus fairly cheap. 
And uh, maybe we've had this period where we could freely ship energy and, and have it on demand all the time. Uh, but it may not be all that bad to go back to the old days. Uh, so, so where I live in the Alps, um, there used to be a lot of uh, aluminum smelters, right? And you think, well, why in the Alps? It's because there was hydroelectricity, right? So, so they just installed the industry where the energy was. And it was the same thing in 17th century Netherlands, uh, where we had this peat, which virtually nobody had, uh, at least not available at, at, at um, water level, so it's easily transported by, uh, by boat. And uh, this gave a significant energy advantage to the Netherlands and, and so to the Dutch economy. Uh, I think half of the world's sugar refineries were in Holland at the time, just because energy was cheap there. And, and that's the reason why Iceland you know, is attracting uh, certain energy industry, uh, heavy industries. And, and maybe we'll go back to something like that, where where we concentrate industries, not only where the energy is, but also when uh, the energy is, i.e., you know, when the sun is shining or when when the wind is blowing. Well, that would mean that Switzerland and surrounding areas could be one of the richest areas in a post fossil fuel era, a century from now or whatever, because you have that height differential and can store water and release it whenever you want um yeah. natural yeah, yeah. natural batteries but look i was looking at the uh, electricity prices in norway uh last week and uh they've virtually been at zero and and finland by the way uh they've virtually been zero because apparently it's rained a lot and all the uh, the 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 dams are very very full and they just have to produce mm-hmm um, so, so indeed, yeah, specific areas will have uh, definite benefits. I think Canada uh, has a lot of hydro as well, so it could be developed. I want to ask you a few personal questions. Um, and you listen to my podcast, so you know what I'm going to ask you. Uh, what uh, advice do you have being a macro observer, being uh, non-energy blind? Uh, do you have any personal advice to listeners uh, at this kind of moment of human predicament and global poly crisis uh yeah read your book <laughs> reality blind uh, yeah look oh, I, I think that, no huh? i think nobody knows about your book to be honest uh your podcasts are, are fairly well known uh but it was a real uh, discovery for me and um it it was an amazing uh, uh thing because uh, apart from being, uh, you know, uh, pretty pretty new uh, for me, and, and I learned some things that I just never thought about, but it's also hilarious, and and so <laughs> my kids would see me laughing out loud on the couch, literally, uh, because of the way you you structured with with your uh, co-author. Um, yeah, my co-author. Most of the funny parts were DJs, but. Oh, uh, well, like you guys have done a, a fantastic job. So I, I'd recommend anybody uh, who's, who's remotely interested. And if you want to have a good time, uh, that, that's a good book. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, no, that's it for me. <laughs> <laughs> and what about young, young humans? Um, what, what recommendations do you have for teenagers and 20 somethings who are coming of age at this, uh, uh, this moment of the carbon pulse. Um, yeah, well, you, you can probably note, I'm, I'm not much into, uh, uh, saying people how to behave, but I, I'm, I'm again going to recommend, uh, reading, uh, uh 80,000 hours, uh, dot org. And it's a wonderful website, um, that sets itself the goal to find out you've got 80,000 hours in your career, how can you do the most good in the world? And I, I think that's a fantastic question to ask. And um, these kids, um, there's some uh, young people from, uh, I think it started at Oxford University, have just kind of fleshed it out and said, well, what's the way to think about it, about your career choices and what you want to do and how you want to contribute to society? Uh, and uh, of course, there's a lot of uh, thinking about um, contributing to um, uh, you know, environmental causes, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so, um, I'd, I'd recommend anybody to check that out. I have not heard of that or seen it. I think it's a great idea. Um, I'm 
I think education is first and foremost, and I think asking questions rather than having answers is is the way to go. Um, I will check that out and we'll put it in the show notes. Um, Joris, what do you care most about in the world? Yeah, that's a, uh, uh, how many answers can I give? Uh, uh, as many as but, you want. <laughs> no, I, I think, I think we humans, we, we, we care about things we spend time on and, and we probably spend time on things we care about. It's like a, a feedback loop. Uh, there you go. Uh, so, so obviously your family and friends, uh, but uh, kind of at a macro level, I, I think I feel a very close connection with nature, you know, as in uh, just life uh, other than humans. I mean, I like humans as well, but, but, uh, but I think we're, we're underappreciating the, the the rest uh, of uh, of the biosphere, and uh, yeah, you know, I I care about maintaining a a, a livable planet and about um, you know conserving nature, I suppose. So I know that you are uh, working on some very interesting things. Um, I'll give you a chance to maybe. Uh, give a teaser of that. But if you were to come back on the podcast, what is something relevant to our futures that you're passionate about that we could take a deep dive on? Heliomimicry, emulating the sun. So, so when you say heliomimicry, are, are you talking directly about um, nuclear fusion or are you thinking other, other things? Yeah, so so uh, th that's the reason I, I coined this new term is um, I think it's it's wider than uh, the the um, types of fusion that people generally consider. Uh, so the most of the uh, work today is done on um, what I'd call high energy fusion. So you have got to make things really hot or very high pressure with lasers uh, or uh, with millions of degrees, like they do in the south of France. And then there's a range of startups that tries to do the same thing, but you know more agile and smarter. So, so there are billions flowing into startups, uh, all in the high energy fusion uh, part. And the part that I actually uh, am, am most interested in is the low energy uh, fusion, also known as cold fusion. And this is uh, much more um, uncertain, right? Uh, it, it, there may only be a percentage chance that it actually works, uh, but it's a risk-reward thing, and that's why I find it so interesting, is if that type of fusion works, you may be able to get on a cost curve much earlier and much lower because those are compact devices uh, that you could do fusion in, whereas the other ones, you're just creating new nuclear power plants, uh, so to speak, that, that are going to take decades and, and billions of dollars to, uh, to develop. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm actually uh, quite interested in, in really testing the edges of science to see if, if there's a mechanism to do fusion at, at low energy. And um, that's not very common, uh, but uh, that happens to be the field that I've uh, kind of investigated over the past decade. And, and, and you, you say there's a percentage chance as in like 1% chance in that ballpark of, of this happening? Uh, yeah, that, that's my view. And, um, uh, and the reason for that is that there are so many, um, uh, results, uh, coming in. Now there's a problem with, uh, repeatability, reproducibility, um, but um, there's a, a research group at MIT who published about this, and they compare it to uh, the transistor development in the, in the 1930s and 40s. Um, in the beginning, we saw effects uh, of, of, of the transistor type that we couldn't place. We didn't understand what was actually going on, and that, that took decades. And it was only when we actually understood the mechanism that we could develop the transistor and that, you know, gave the, the, the microchip industry. And um, I think something similar may be going on uh, with all the cold fusion initiatives. And uh, this is why, for example, Google put uh, 10 million into it a couple of years back. Um, they didn't find anything, but it was a uh, good science. They published in Nature about it. Um, I think there's 
possibility uh, that one of these groups uh, will uh, will break through. And of course, there's also an overwhelming possibility that they won't. Uh, but it's worth uh, it's worth looking for. I have two general re replies to that. One is most of the titans in AI believe that AI will solve <clears throat> the heliomimicry challenge. Um, I think a hundred terawatt society uh, would destroy the earth and, and pull in so many non-carbon aspects of our natural world um, that there would be nothing left unless that technology was matched with social and, and governance innovations as well as the technological innovation. That's, that's my general sense on that. Uh, I, I, look, I, I think you're right. It's, it's at, at the same time, it's um, something that could really help us. Uh, but on the other hand, we have to get a lot smarter about how not to ruin the planet further. And if we get more powerful only uh, to speed up our, our plundering of the planet, that may not be uh, the best outcome for, uh, for man. Uh, but in the meantime, if something like that can really help us uh, speed up an energy transition, so for that it would have to happen soon, um, that might be of interest. So if I have a nuclear fusion reality roundtable or something, would you like to join in on that? Do you have enough uh, insights and, and ideas? Um, yeah, sure. Okay, we'll, we'll do it. Joris, thanks so much uh, for your time and for reaching out to me a, a couple years ago. Um, and uh, to be continued, mon ami. All right, thanks, Nate. If you enjoyed or learned from this episode of The Great Simplification, please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and visit thegreatsimplification.com for more information on future releases.